Jumper the cat. I did indeed get a haircut. So kind of you for... Fuck this gate. Alright, let's start over. Starting over right now. Alright. Welcome to the Carter Banks Hour. Every night I read a chapter of a book. This book in particular is called Cancer Ward. It's by Alexander Solzhenitsyn. I read chapter 23 last week or thereabouts. And this is chapter 24 called Transfusion of Blood. So here we go. Chapter 24, Transfusion of Blood. Kostogotov was sitting in a sunny spot on a stone below a garden bench. He was wearing his boots, and his legs were curled uncomfortably underneath him, knees just off the ground. His arms were dangling lifelessly down to the ground. His uncovered head was hanging forward. He was sitting there, warming himself, his gray dressing gown open, as unmoving and angular as the gray stone. His head with its cap of black hair was baking hot. The sun was scorching his back as he sat there motionless, soaking in the march warmth, doing nothing and thinking nothing. He could sit blankly like that for a long time, gleaning from the sun's warmth what had not been provided for him earlier in the bread and soup. From a distance, one could not even see his shoulders rising and falling as he breathed, but he had not toppled to one side. Somehow he had held himself up. A fat orderly from the main floor came along the path. She was a large woman who had once tried to chase him out of the corridor for contaminating it. She was addicted to sunflower seeds. Now that she was out in the garden, she was making the most of her chance to crack a few seeds. She came up to him and called out in her good-natured fishwife's voice, Hey, uncle! Can you hear me, uncle? Uncle? Kostoglatov raised his head and screwed up his face against the sun. Her figure looked distorted through his half-closed eyes. Go to the dressings room! Doctor wants you! He had sat there so long he was like just another warm stone. The last thing he wanted was to move or get up. He felt like a man who had to go to some job he hated. What doctor? he growled. The one who wants you, the one who says you are good to go. The orderly raised her voice. It's not my job to come out and round you all up in the garden. Get inside. But I haven't anything that needs dressing. It can't be me they want, said Gostogletov, refusing to go in. It's you all right, the orderly was stuffing sunflower seeds into her mouth in between sentences. I wouldn't mix you up with anyone, you long-nosed stork. There's no one else like you round here, darling. Kostogostov sighed, straightened his legs and began to get up, groaning and supporting himself with his hands. The orderly looked at him disapprovingly. Walk, 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 you should have saved your strength. You should have been lying down. Oh, sighed Kostogostov. We don't know everything before it happens, do we? And he dragged himself along the garden path. He wasn't wearing his belt now. There was nothing left of his military bearing. His back was all bent. He walked towards the dressing room, expecting to encounter some new unpleasantness and ready to fight it off, though he didn't know what it might be. Waiting for him in the dressing room was not Elia Rafaelovna, who had taken Vera Kornilyevna's place for the past ten days, but a plump young woman. She was more than apple-cheeked. Her cheeks were positively crimson with health. It was the first time he had seen her. What's your name? She asked right away while he was still in the doorway. 
The sun was no longer in Kostoglatov's eyes, but he was still screwing them up and looking as displeased as ever. He was eager to figure out what was going on, to get an idea of the situation, but he was in no hurry to answer questions. Sometimes a man has to hide his name or to lie about it. He didn't yet know what was the right thing to do. Well, what's your name? The plump armed doctor asked again. Kostoglatov, he confessed reluctantly. Where have you been? Get your clothes off quickly. Come here and lie down on the table. It was only now that Kostoglatov remembered, saw, and understood all at once. It was a blood transfusion. He had forgotten they did it in the dressing rooms. First of all, he wanted to stick to his former principles. He didn't want anyone else's blood, and he wouldn't give his own. In the second place, this pert little woman, who looked as if she had drunk her fill of donor's blood herself, <laughs> inspired no confidence in him. Vera had gone away. Once more, there was a new doctor with different habits and fresh mistakes. What the hell was the use of this merry-go-round? Why wasn't anything permanent? Sullenly, he took off his dressing gown. He didn't know where to hang it. The nurse showed him where, and all the time he was trying to think up a pretext for not giving in. He hung up his dressing gown. He took off his jacket and hung that up. He pushed his boots into the corner. He walked barefoot across the clean linoleum floor and lay down on the high, padded table. He still couldn't think of any reason to refuse, but he knew he'd be able to think something up presently. The transfusion apparatus, rubber tubes and glass pipes with water in one of them, towered above the table on a shining steel support. On the same stand, there were several rings for different sized bottles, half liter, quarter liter, and one eighth liter. The last ring was full. The brownish colored blood was partly covered by a label to mark the blood group, the donor's name and the date on which it had been taken. Kostoglatov was used to looking at things he wasn't supposed to look at. So while he was climbing onto the table, he read what was written on the label. Instead of laying his head back against the headrest, he announced, Aha! February 28th. Old blood. You can't use that. Who are you to say that? Said the doctor indignantly. Old blood? New blood, what do you understand about preservation? Blood can be kept over a month. Her anger stood out. A bright raspberry color against her pink face. Her arms, bare to the elbow, were plump and rosy, but the skin was covered in goose pimples. It was not because of the cold. They were permanent. For some reason, it was these goose pimples that finally convinced Kostogotov not to give in. Roll up your sleeve, the doctor ordered. Lower your arm and let it relax. This was the second year she had been working on blood transfusions, and she could not remember a single patient who had not been suspicious. They all behaved as though theirs was the purest aristocratic blood, and they were afraid of it being tainted. Invariably, they looked sideways at the blood and claimed the color wasn't right, or the group wasn't right, or that it was too hot or too cold, or that it was congealed, or else they would ask straight out, Why are you giving me bad blood? Why should it be bad? Because it's written on it, do not touch? Yes, that's because it was earmarked for someone else. But he doesn't need it anymore. Even after the patient had let her put the needle in, even after the patient had let her put the needle in, he would go on muttering to himself, That means it's not proper quality. Firmness was the only way of breaking down these stupid suspicions. Furthermore, she was always in a hurry because she had a blood transfusions quota to get through every day in various different places. Kostoglatov had already seen people with 
bloody swellings in the clinic. Chematomas, they were called, because a vein had been double punctured or the end of the needle misdirected. He had seen people trembling and feverish after transfusions because the blood had been introduced too hastily, and he had no inclination whatever to entrust himself to those impatient, pink, puffy, goose pimply arms. His own sluggish, diseased blood, ruined by the X rays, was still more precious to him than any fresh addition. His own blood would sooner or later recover. And if his bad blood made them stop the treatment, so much the better. No, he said grimly, refusing to roll up his sleeve or let his arm relax. Your blood's old. Anyway, I don't feel well today. Of course, he knew he shouldn't give two excuses at the same time, only one. But the two came out together. We'll check the pressure right away, said the doctor, quite unabashed. The nurse was already handing her the instrument. The doctor was a complete newcomer, but the nurse belonged to the clinic. She worked in the dressings room. Oleg had never... Oleg had never ha dealings with her before. Okay, that's a fucking misspelling again. The doctor was a complete newcomer, but the nurse belonged to the clinic. She worked in the dressings room. Oleg had never ha dealings with her before. Okay, this is page 329. There's a missing D, just so you know. I found it. Uh, I'm going to correct it for the record. The doctor was a complete newcomer, but the nurse belonged to the clinic. She had worked in the dressing room. She had worked in the dressings room. Oleg had never had dealings with her before. She was no more than a girl, but quite tall. All right, there's another, it's another misspelling. I think actually um, part of this page got cut off. It's uh, very bizarre. So quite. Um, in fact, I'm going to ignore all of this and just start this uh, paragraph over one sec. Yes, what's up? Hey, thanks for joining. If you haven't already, please do subscribe to this YouTube channel. Um, that would help me loads, and I can continue reading these books. The doctor was a complete newcomer, but the nurse belonged to the clinic. She worked in the dressings room. Oleg had never had dealings with her before. She was no more than a girl, but quite tall, with a dark complexion and a Japanese slant to her eyes. Her hair was piled on top of her head in such a complicated way that no cap or scarf would ever have been able to cover it. Every lock and turret of her tower of hair had been patiently bound with innumerable bandages. She must have come on duty 15 minutes early to get the bandaging done. None of this was much use to Oleg, but still he studied her white Tierra with interest, trying to imagine what her hair looked like under the bandages. The one in charge here was the doctor, and instead of delaying, he ought to be defending himself against her, making objections and trying to talk his way out. Yet, here he was, losing the rhythm of his arguments by watching the girl with the Japanese slant to her eyes. Like every young girl, she embodied some sort of an enigma simply because she was young. She carried it with every step she took and was conscious of it at every turn of her head. Meanwhile, they had wrapped a great black snake round Kostoglatov's arm to squeeze it and to check that he had the right pressure. He opened his mouth to raise another objection, but just then, someone in the doorway called the doctor to go to the telephone. She gave a start and walked off. The nurse began to put the black tubes back into their case. Oleg stayed lying on his back. Where does the doctor come from, eh? He asked. Every tone in this girl's voice was part of the enigma that surrounded her. She knew this, and when she spoke, she seemed to be listening to her own voice with great attention. From the blood transfusion, station, she said. Why did she bring that old stuff then? 
asked Oleg. She was only a girl, but he wanted to test his guest. It's not old. The girl turned her head smoothly and carried the white tiara across the room. The little girl was quite convinced she knew everything that she needed to know. And maybe she did. The sun had come round to the side of the building where the dressing's room was. It didn't come straight in through the windows, but two of the panes were shining brightly, and part of the ceiling was covered by a large patch of light reflected off something shiny. It was very bright and clean, and quiet, too. It was nice being in the room. A door opened outside Oleg's field of vision. Someone came in, another woman. She walked in. Her shoes made hardly any noise. Her little heels didn't tap out her identity, and Oleg guessed. No one else walked like that. It was she he was missing in the room. She and no one else. Vega! Yes, it was she. She walked into his field of vision, walked into it so simply, as though it was hardly any time at all since she'd stepped out of it. Where have you been, Vera Kornilyevna? Oleg was smiling. He didn't exclaim. He asked the question quietly and happily. And he didn't sit up, even though they hadn't tied him down to the table. The room became quiet, bright, and comfortable. Just perfect. Vega, too, had her own question to ask him. Are you rebelling? She, too, was smiling but his plan to resist had already weakened. He was enjoying himself, lying there on the table. He wouldn't be got off it as easily as that. Me? No, I'm through with rebellions. Where have you been? It's been more than a week. She spoke distinctly as though dictating unusual or new words to someone particularly slow-witted. She stood over him and said, I've been traveling round, setting up oncological stations. Health propaganda, trying to fight cancer. Somewhere out in the wilds? Yes. And now you've finished traveling? For the time being, but what about you? You aren't feeling well? What was it in those eyes? Unhurried attentiveness. The first unverified note of alarm. The eye of a doctor. But apart from that, they were light brown eyes, like a glass of coffee with two fingers of milk in it. But of course it was years since Oleg had last drunk coffee. Friendly. That's what they were. The eyes of a very old friend. Oh no, it's nothing. I've probably got a touch of the sun. I sat there for ages. I almost fell asleep. How could you sit in the sun? Haven't you learned during all the time you've been here that's forbidden? Exposing tumors to heat? I thought it was only hot water bottles. Sun's even more strictly forbidden. You mean I'm not allowed to go to the Black Sea beaches? She nodded. What a life. I'd better have my exile transferred to Norilsk. She lifted her shoulders, then dropped them. It was something beyond her power, even beyond her comprehension. So why have you been unfaithful? What's that? To our agreement. You promised you'd give me the blood transfusions yourself, not hand me over to some student. She's not a student. To the contrary, she's a specialist. We have no right to do transfusions when she's here. But she's gone away now. What do you mean, gone? She was sent for. What a merry-go-round. A merry-go-round that didn't even protect him from other merry-go-rounds. So you'll do it? Yes, I will, but what's all this about old blood? He nodded, his head toward it. It's not old, but it's not for you either. We'll give you 250 grams here, Vera Kornilyevna brought it over from the other table and showed it to him. Read this. Check the label for yourself. You know, Vera Kornilyevna, it's a miserable, cursed life 
I lead. Never believe anything. Check everything. Don't you think I'm happier when I don't have to check? He said this in a weary voice like a dying man, but his alert eyes couldn't restrain themselves from making sure they took in the words Group A, Yaroslavetseva, Irina L. March 5th. Ah, March 5th, that'll be just right, Oleg cheered up. That's bound to do us good. So you do realize what good it does you. At last. And you made such a fuss before. She didn't understand what he meant. Oh well, never mind. He rolled his shirt sleeve up over his elbow and let his arm fall, relaxed alongside his body. It was true. For a man like Oleg, who had to be permanently suspicious and watchful, it was the great pleasure in the world to be able to trust, to give himself to trust. And he trusted this woman, this gentle, ethereal creature. He knew she'd move softly. There's an asterisk here. The most northerly large city in Soviet Union, in the Soviet Union. Uh, the asterisk is, I guess, next to Norilsk. Yeah, okay, well, I already knew that. But you might not have, and you. Thinking out her every action, and that she wouldn't make the slightest mistake. And so he lay there, and felt as though he was having a rest. The large patch of sunlight on the ceiling, weak as though filtered through lace, formed an uneven circle. This patch, reflected off he didn't know what, was contributing to his happiness and beautifying the clean, quiet room. Vera Kornelievna had perfidiously drawn some blood out of his vein with a needle. She was turning the centrifuge and breaking up the blood into four sectors. Why four? He only asked because all his life, everywhere he went, he had been in the habit of asking questions. In fact, at the moment he felt he couldn't even be bothered to know. One for compatibility, and three to check the distribution center for group accuracy, just in case. But if the group's the right one, why check the compatibility? In case the patient's serum congeals after contact with the donor's blood. It's rare, but it does happen. I see. But why do you turn it? To push back the red corpuscles, you have to know everything, don't you? Of course, he didn't really have to know everything. Oleg looked at the patch hovering on the ceiling. You can't know everything in the world. Whatever happens, you'll die a fool. The nurse with the white tiara inserted the upturned March 5 bottle into the clamps on the stand. And she put a little pillow under his elbow. She pulled tight the red rubber sling over his arm above the elbow and began to twist it. Her Japanese eyes gauged how far she could go. It was strange that he had seen some sort of an enigma in this girl. There just wasn't one. She was a girl like any other. Up walked Vera Gengard. With the syringe, it was an ordinary one full of colorless liquid. But the needle was unusual. A tube, rather than a needle. A tube with a triangular end. There was nothing wrong with this tube in itself just so long as no one was going to drive it into you. Your vein stands out well, Vera Kornelievna began to say. One of her eyebrows twitched as she looked for it, then with concentration, puncturing the skin so that he could scarcely feel it. She introduced the monstrous needle, and that was all. There was still a lot he didn't understand. Why did they twist the sling above his elbow? What was that water-like liquid in the syringe for? He could ask, of course, but he could also try to work it out for himself. It was probably to stop air rushing into the vein and blood rushing into the syringe. Meanwhile, the needle remained in his vein. The pressure of the sling was released and it was taken off. The syringe was skillfully removed, and the nurse shook the tip of the instrument over a little bowl to get rid of the first drops of blood. 
Now Gengart was fixing this tip to the needle instead of the syringe. She held it in place, at the same time slightly opening the screw on the top. Inside the widening glass pipe of the instrument, a number of transparent bubbles began to rise slowly, one by one through the transparent liquid. Questions kept occurring to him, floating up like the bubbles, one after the other. Why such a wide needle? Why did they shake off the blood? What did the bubbles mean? One fool can ask enough questions to keep hundreds of wise men too busy to answer them all. If he was going to ask questions, he wanted to ask them about something else. There was a festive air about everything in the room, especially the sun-bleached patch on the ceiling. The needle had to stay in a long time. The level of the blood in the bottle had hardly dropped. Indeed, it hadn't dropped at all. Do you need me, Vera Kornelyevna? asked the nurse, the Japanese girl. She spoke with deference, still listening to her own voice. No, I don't need you, Gengard answered quickly. I'll go out for a bit. Can I take half an hour? Yes, as far as I'm concerned, I don't need you. The nurse with the white tiara almost ran out. They were left, just the two of them. Slowly, the bubbles rose. Then Vera Kornelievna touched the screw, and they stopped rising. Not one single bubble remained. You've turned it off. Yes. But why? You always have to know, don't you? She smiled at him, this time encouragingly. It was very quiet in the dressings room. They were old walls and the doors were sturdy. One could speak in a voice slightly over a whisper, just breathe effortlessly out and talk while doing it. That was the way he wanted to speak. Yes, I know I'm difficult to deal with. I always want to know more than I'm allowed to know. It's good you still want to, she observed. Her lips were never uninvolved in the words they were pronouncing. Tiny movements of her mouth, quirks in the right hand or left hand corner, a slight pout or a slight twitch, emphasized each thought and illuminated it. After the first 25 cubic centimeters, we're supposed to pause for a time and see how the patient is feeling. One hand still held the tip against the needle, just one hand. She shifted her smile slightly, welcomingly and inquiringly, and looked into Oleg's eyes as she leaned over him. How do you feel? At this precise moment, excellent. At this precise moment, excellent. Isn't that putting it rather strongly? No, I really feel excellent. Much better than well. I want to start this over just because this dialogue is, like, really important. Um, in previous chapters. To be completely honest, my favorite romantic interest in this book is Oleg and Vera Kornelievna, a.k.a. Gangart. So I definitely want to, uh do this justice. So here we go. I'm going to start this, this, uh, I'll start this paragraph over. After the first 25 cubic centimeters, we're supposed to pause for a time and see how the patient is feeling. One hand still held the tip against the needle. Just one hand. She shifted her smile slightly welcomingly and inquiringly and looked into Oleg's eyes as she leaned over him. How do you feel? At this precise moment, excellent. Isn't that putting it rather strongly? No, I really feel excellent. Much better than well. No shivering? No unpleasant taste in the mouth? Nothing of that? No. The bottle, the needle, and the transfusion formed a task that united them in a common concern for someone quite apart from themselves. Someone whom they were trying to treat together and cure. And apart from this precise moment, it was wonderful just being there. 
looking minute after minute into each other's eyes at a time when they had a perfect right to do so, when there was no need to look away. Well, generally, I feel awful. Awful? Why? She asked it sympathetically and anxiously, like a friend, but she had deserved the blow, and Oleg felt that now was the time to deliver it. However soft her bright, light brown eyes were, she wouldn't escape. It's my morale that's awful. Awful because I know that I'm paying too high a price for my life, and that even you, yes, you are involved in the process and are deceiving me. Me? When eyes gaze endlessly into each other, they acquire an entirely new quality. You see things never revealed in passing glances. The eyes seem to lose their protective colored retina. The whole truth comes splashing out wordlessly and cannot be contained. How could you have assured me so fervently that these injections were necessary and that I wouldn't understand the point of them? What is there to understand? It's hormone therapy. What is there to understand about that? Of course, it wasn't fair. It wasn't fair to take those defenseless brown eyes so unawares. But it was the only way of really asking the question. Something in her eyes jumped. She was quite staggered. And Dr. Gengard, no, it wasn't Dr. Gengard, it was Vega, turned away her eyes. So they would withdraw a company from the field of battle before its final rout. She looked at the bottle, but what was there to look at when the blood flow had stopped? She looked at the bubbles, but the bubbles weren't rising either. Then she turned on to the screw. The bubbles started. It was time. It was done anyway. Her fingers stroked the rubber tube that hung down from the instrument to the needle. It was as if they were helping to remove all obstructions in the tube. She put some more absorbent cotton under the tip and make sure the tube wouldn't bend. He saw she had some adhesive tape. She took a strip of it and stuck the tip to his arm. Then she threaded the rubber tube through his fingers. The fingers of the same hand. They were stuck up in the air like hooks. Thereafter, the tube held itself in position. There was now no need for Vega to hold it, or to stand by his side, or to gaze into his eyes. Her face was stern and clouded as she adjusted the flow of the bubbles to make it more frequent. That's the way, she said. Just lie still. And she left. She didn't go completely off stage. She only left the part of it in his field of vision. He had to lie quite still. It meant that the only thing in sight were the instrument stand, the bottle of brown blood, the shiny bubbles, the tops of the sunlit windows, the reflections of the windows in their six panes in the frosted glass of the lamp, globe, and the whole expanse of the ceiling with its shimmering patch of faint sunlight. Vega was no longer there. The question seemed to have fallen flat, like an object passed carelessly, clumsily, from hand to hand, and she hadn't picked it up. It was up to Oleg to go on working on it. Looking up at the ceiling, he began slowly thinking aloud, If my life is totally lost, if I can feel it in my bones, the memory that I'm a prisoner in perpetuity, a perpetual con, if fate holds out no better prospect, if the only expectation I have is being consciously and artificially killed, then why bother to save such a life? Vega heard everything, but she was off stage. Perhaps it was better this way. It was easier to speak. First, my own life was taken from me, and now I'm being deprived even of the right to perpetuate myself. I'll be the worst sort of cripple. What use will I be to anyone? An object of men's pity or charity. Vega said nothing. 
That patch on the ceiling, from time to time it seemed to quiver, to contract at the edges, it was as if a frown was passing over it, as if it too was thinking, but couldn't understand, then it would become motionless once more. The gay, transparent bubbles kept gurgling. The level of blood in the bottle was falling. A quarter of it was already transfused. It was women's blood, the blood of Yaroslavetseva, Irina L. Was she a girl? An old woman? A student? Or a market woman? Yes. Charity. Keeping out of sight, Vega didn't start arguing with him. Instead, she suddenly launched out from where she was standing. No, it's not true. You don't really believe that, do you? I know you don't. Examine yourself. Those aren't your ideas. You've borrowed them from somewhere else. You haven't... All right. I'm going to try and, and, for my own benefit, explain what's going on here. He's talking to himself, I think. Um, but he's doing it with the intent of her to hear him so that... I'm picturing her, like, tinkering with blood and, um, you know, graduated cylinders and stuff off to the side. And he's, like, sitting there muttering to himself out loud, pondering what's going on. And uh, I think he's kind of baiting her in to see if, like, she'll chime in. Because he's, he's kind of doing some, I don't know. She missed the, uh, the earlier his advances, and I think now, when she pops out, I'm picturing, like, yeah, ah! I'm picturing her being, like, um, I don't know, let me read this again, and it, it may make, ha, it may make enough sense for me to read it correctly this time. Vega said nothing. That patch on the ceiling, from time to time it seemed to quiver, to contract at the edges. It was as if a frown was passing over it, as if it too was thinking but couldn't understand. Then it would become motionless once more. The gay transparent bubbles kept gurgling. The level of blood in the bottle was falling. A quarter of it was already transfused. It was woman's blood. The blood of Yaroslavetseva, Arena L? Was she a girl? An old woman? A student? Or a market woman? Yes, charity. Keeping out of sight, Vega didn't start arguing with him. Instead, she suddenly launched out from where she was standing. No, it's not true. You don't really believe that, do you? I know you don't. Examine yourself. Those aren't your ideas. You've borrowed them from somewhere else, haven't you? She spoke with more force than he had heard in her voice before. It was full of wounded feeling more than he would ever have expected. Suddenly, she cut herself short and fell silent. What do you expect me to believe, then? Oleg tried cautiously to draw her out. Goodness, what a silence. You could even hear the little light bubbles in the glass balloon. They made a faint ringing noise. It was hard for her to speak. Her voice was shattered. She was trying to pull herself up out of the ditch. But it was beyond her strength. There must be some people who think differently. Maybe a few, maybe only a handful, but differently all the same. If everyone thought your way, who could we live with? What would we live for? Would we be able to live at all? She had pulled herself up and over the edge. The last words came crying from her with a new sort of despair. It was as if her protest had jolted him, as if she had jolted him with all the petty strength she possessed, moving his heavy, reddened body to reach the only place of salvation possible. Like a stone thrown boldly from a boy's sling, made out of a sunflower stem that lengthened his arm, or like a shell fired out of one of those long-barreled guns in the last year of the war, a whooshing, whistling shell, shuddering noisily through the air. Oleg shot up and flew in a crazy parabola, 
breaking loose from everything he had memorized and sweeping away everything he'd borrowed from other people, high over the wastelands of his life, one wasteland after the other, until he came to some land of long ago. It was the country of his childhood. He didn't recognize it at once, but the moment his blinking, still clouded eyes did recognize it, he was ashamed. He remembered how he used to believe the same when he was a boy, and he was ashamed she had had to rediscover it for him instead of him telling her. There was something else coming back to him, too, out of his memory. It was perfect for the occasion. He simply had to get it into his mind. Then he remembered. He remembered it in a flash, but when he began to speak, it was slowly and reasoningly taking one thing at a time. In the 1920s, there was some books by a certain venerologist, Dr. Friedland. They were immensely successful in those days. People thought it a good thing to open people's eyes, the eyes of the youth and the whole nation. It was medical information about the most unmentionable of subjects. And very likely it was necessary, better than hypocritical silence. There was a book called Behind the Closed Door, and another called The Sufferings of Love. You didn't read them by any chance, did you? Being a doctor, I thought perhaps you... The odd bubble was still gurgling. Off stage, perhaps, it was her breathing one could hear. I must admit, he said, I read them at a very early age. I was probably about twelve. Of course, I didn't let the grown-ups see me. Reading them made a shattering impression on me, but it was somehow emptying as well. I had the feeling I didn't really want to live anymore. Suddenly she answered his question. I read them too, she said expressionlessly. You did, did you? You too? said Oleg delightedly. He said the words, you too, as though he still felt he was the first to make that particular point. Such insistent, logical, irrefutable materialism, and the result was the point of living. Everything totted up in exact percentages. How many women experience nothing at all? How many women experience ecstasy? Those stories about how women move from category to category in search of own identity. As he remembered more and more, he drew in his breath as though he had been hit or had hurt himself. Such heartless certainty that psychology is of secondary importance in marriage. The writer makes the point that physiology is the sole cause of incompatibility. But of course, you remember, don't you? When did you read them? She didn't answer. He shouldn't have interrogated her like that. He probably put it much too crudely and bluntly. He had absolutely no experience of talking to women. The strange patch of pale sunlight on the ceiling suddenly began to ripple. A flashing cluster of silver spots appeared from somewhere. They began to move about. Oleg watched the fast-moving ripples and wavelets. He had finally realized that the mysterious flash high up on the ceiling was no more than a reflection of a puddle, a patch of ground outside the window by the fence that he hadn't dried up yet. The image of an ordinary puddle. But now a little breeze had begun to blow. Vega was silent. Please forgive me, Oleg begged. He found it agreeable, almost a delight to plead with her. Somehow I don't think I put it right. He tried to twist his head toward her, but still he couldn't see her. You see, that sort of attitude destroys everything human on earth. If you give in to it, if you accept it and everything it entails, he, he was now surrendering joyfully to his former faith. He was trying to persuade her. Vega came back. She returned on stage, her face showing none of the despair or harshness he had thought he detected in her voice. There was the usual friendly smile. I don't want you to accept it either, she said. 
I was sure you didn't accept it. She shone, she actually shone. Yes, she was that little girl from his childhood. His school friend. Why hadn't he recognized her before? Holy fuck! If this is literal, that means that... Vera Gengart is a girl he had a crush on as a child. And they both ended up in the cancer ward. And she's his nurse. That's crazy! What? Yes, she was that little girl from his childhood, his school friend? What? Why hadn't he recognized her before? Whoa. He felt like saying something quite simple and friendly to her. Something like, let's shake hands on it. Then he would take her hand and, my God, it's wonderful just talking to you. His right arm was under the needle, though. If only he could call her Vega or Vera. But it wasn't possible. The blood in the bottle had already dropped by more than half. It had once flowed in someone else's body, a body with its own personality, its own ideas, and now it was pouring into him, a reddish-brown stream of health. Surely it must be bringing some of its own characteristics. Oleg watched Vega bustling about. She straightened the little pillow under his elbow, and the absorbent cotton under the tip. She stroked the rubber tube with her fingers and began to raise the upper part of the stand which held the bottle. He wanted to do more than shake that hand. He wanted to kiss it, even though it would have been a contradiction of everything he had said. That's the end of chapter four, and whoa, I just gotta say, I was not expecting that at all. Chapter 25 is called Vega, and I gotta say, this next chapter, I can only predict it's going to be about how she got to this cancer ward. I'm, my mind is blown right now. 340 pages in, and, ho! Oh, uh, this is the Carter Banks Hour. By the way, this is Cancer Ward. We're on chapter 24. We just finished chapter 24. The next chapter is called Vega. It's chapter 25. Um, but yeah. I'm going to put a link here, and if you want to listen to chapters 1 through 24 sometime between now and next week, you can share in this super extremely crazy twist that just happened. Yeah, I don't know. This is crazy. But anyway, um, subscribe to this channel if you want to follow. Uh, I read uh, a chapter a night at 9 p.m. Um, of a book. And yeah, tune in to the Carter Banks Hour at, um, at Carter Banks on YouTube, and I will uh, read 25 on tomorrow. Good night, and be safe. Peace.